Okay, let's let's get the show on the road. My name is Jeremy Till. I am head of St. St. Martin's and Pro Vice Chancellor for Research. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, very impressive that on a Friday people have still got an appetite for Zoom. Um, and to have this session, which I think is going to be really interesting, with the um, three UAL institutes. So what I'm going to do, just to make sure that if you could keep your mics um, muted, I think they are muted automatically, actually. Uh, if you can put questions or comments, probably best in the Q&A box so that they're all in one place so that Lynn can pick those up. And just to remind everybody that this event is being recorded. So the I am particularly interested as PVC research, but as an active researcher myself, in the way that creative research can make a positive contribution to societal change. And I think that given the very pressing issues that have confronted the world, particularly recently, in relation to climate, in relation to race, and in relation to social justice. I am convinced that UAL has a major role to play in the researchers, the knowledge exchangers, the students, the teachers, all engaging with these issues. And I'm sure that in these short presentations from um, the three that we are going to get an insight as to how that contribution might best be enacted. So what I'm going to do is, is quickly introduce the three speakers um, all at once and also to their institutes. So the first speaker is Professor Lucy Kimball who is director of the Social Design Institute and the Social Design Institute all of the institutes work across the university and bring together thematics and researchers and teachers together under a single banner. And the Social Design Institute, which was set up um, about two years ago, does that more or less as it says on the tin. Well, they all do what they say on the tin, which is look at social design, about how designers and organisations might use their creative and research-driven design sensibilities in relation to engaging with societal issues and in that to make a social and environmental difference. And I really strongly recommend, in, in the case of all of them, that they that all of them have got very powerful um, websites, but Lucy and the members of the Social Design Institute have, have reached out across the community and, and there's some very good papers, position papers, kind of quite provisional, quite quite straightforward position papers, which set out what social design might mean and how it might operate. Then after that, we have Professor Susan Puitan Locke, who is the director of the Decolonizing Arts Institute, which has been established to challenge the colonial and imperial legacies in relation to to, to art, but more importantly, then to work through from that challenge into how we might make societal and institutional change in those areas. And the Institute builds on some pioneering work and research done most famously, I think, in the HRC Black Arts and Modernism project, but also in the groundbreaking work that Shades of Noir, which is now called the Centre for Race and Practice Based Social Justice, has done in the field of, of race studies in relation to the creative arts. Uh, and finally, we've got Professor Mick Grierson, who's research leader for the Creative Computing Industry in Institute. And the CCI was the first institute out of the blocks and has established both undergraduate and master's level courses. So it's a, it's a teaching uh, institute, but Mick is going to tell us about the research that he and his partners are doing in it. And I think the Creative Institute 
Creative Computing Institute has, has been really a game changer, both at UAL, but also in the sector, in bringing together issues of, of how one might use creative computing in relation to societal and educational transformation. So I think at the very least, for those of you who don't know about the institutes, you're going to get a quick insight into the work that each of them do. And I hope that for those of you who've, who are, whose um, interest is piqued, that you can then engage with them. I mean, just Lucy will be able to correct me, but just in, we, they did a survey of, of PhD students at UAL in relation to those PhD students who were engaged in their thesis studies in social design. I think it was in the 70s. So I mean, really quite a lot of, you know, a lot of action going on in those areas, but in, and also clearly in decolonization and, and then also in, in computing. So I'm going to hand over first to Lucy. Each have got 10 minutes. So listen put your questions within the Q&A and we will have time after the presentations to have a discussion about the role of research in these institutes in relation to the issues of this research season, which are earth equity and racial justice. Okay, Lucy, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy and Lynn, first slide, please. Okay, so over the past decade, it has become mainstream um, in practice and in universities in the global north to think that professional design has something special and unique to contribute to the challenges of the climate emergency, social injustice um, and institutional inequalities. Um, we've seen the emergence of something distinctive called social design that takes as its object not the design of products or communications or services or interactions or buildings, but the design of society itself. Um, and design practices and principles are seen as having something distinctive and much needed to address um, those social and environmental challenges through things like making things tangible and visible, assembling publics, involving participants in co-design, understanding people's lived experiences and bringing that into designing and doing early small scale experiments to try out ideas and get things going. And underpinning all of this is design's orientation to criticizing the as is and proposing what could be. But alongside this purposeful design to address social, environmental and governance, governance challenges, there's a growing recognition of the inequalities that are reproduced through design, embedded in the um, values and institutions of contemporary design uh, in the global north and the outcomes of designing. So along with this shift in purpose and scale towards the social, designers and people using design skills are having to rethink the socials in design practices and design things in use and how they might need to change. So in this brief talk, I'm gonna just share some of the perspectives that we're at the Social Design Institute, where we aim, next slide, Lynn, please. We aim on the one hand to enable and amplify UAL's work in using design um, to address contemporary issues and the extensive expertise and, and uh, award-winning work of our specialist centres, the Centre for Sustainable Fashion, the Centre for Circular Design and the Design Against Crime Research Centre at UAL. So, so building on and amplifying those, but also working across the university more broadly on the one hand and on the other hand to develop um, critical and contextual uh, understandings of social design itself. And we do this through research, knowledge exchange and intersecting with teaching and learning. So I'm going to briefly describe some of those, some examples of what we've been doing in the last couple of years. Next slide, please. So we have, because social design is such a large construct, we have decided to focus on these three areas, value and valuation systems and public policy. And each of those itself is really large. Um, um, and if you could move to the next slide, um, we're going to on the next slide, some highlights, some of the projects. So one piece of work that is <laughs> about to be, finished or in the middle of um, some deliverables for Tuesday is for the Design Council. Um, as you know, probably the large uh, body founded post-war 
to argue for in particular industrial design, although it also now includes um, uh, built environments through the incorporation of CABE. Um, and in 2018, the design economy was presented as, as this, a, a sort of, hey, the design economy, so that's specialist design organizations and organizations with a large preponderance of design specialists generated this amount of gross value added. It was an economic narrative. Um, in 2021, however, the Design Council um, wants to be able to update this. Um, what, how big is the design economy? What does it look like? Where is it? Um, but also now understand a broader set of questions. Next slide, please. And so we are um, finalizing a series of papers that we're developing with BOP Consulting, which are uh, the methodology for how the Design Council we propose should do this work. So not just the economic value of design, but its social and environmental impact, business, public sector use and public understanding. And these will be in the public domain in about May. So that's consultancy. Next slide, please. Um, internally, we've been um, using some of the resources provided by AKO Foundation to um, seed fund uh, and support uh, uh, through collaboration with uh, Social Design Institute um, some individuals um, across the colleges and you see their names and projects here. Um, and actually the first two projects have more of a mess joined forces because they're both dealing with the issue of um, vaccine hesitancy and communications. Um, and the, 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 the third project um, um, is, is in particular dealing with working with a collaborative, uh, through a collaborative project with a, um, a small um, organization that addresses knife crime through, through co-design. So these are extraordinary projects that we are supporting with a particular focus on systems and value and policy. Um, we also uh, are, have some uh, ongoing research funded by the UKRI, so that's the UK Research and Innovation. This one um, is um, dealing with the challenge of antibiotic use uh, or overuse or misuse in India. So it's with Indian partner academics, um, and so the output is um, regulations, so proposed regulations for how India, Indian states and the Indian federal government should enact um, uh, basically a kind of behavior change and systems change. Um, and in this work, our work is as we're not the help, we're, we're supporting using design skills to support the design of regulations, although we would not claim any expertise. Um, certainly in my team um, in antibiotic use or epidemiology um, or indeed uh, regulations. Um, next slide please. Um, another project that's just in the concluding phase and had an event on earlier this week, also funded by UKRI, took the problem of AI and what it might mean for professional services. Now you might argue this has got nothing to do with social design, it's to do with law firms and accounting firms, um, and how they might change. It's a very much a business facing project. But if you take the uh, real problem in the UK of access to justice, um, access to justice is limited by the costs and availability of lawyers. Um, and it could be, according to one uh, knowledgeable person, that AI actually increases access to justice and is a good thing for society as a whole because it will um, automate and enable people to find um, the legal information they need rather than having to go to an expensive face-to-face -face meeting. So there's a whole set of things going on there which are to do with the design of services um, which are integral to uh, business, the economy and government um, and indeed um, democracy in the UK with a strong functioning legal sector. And that's a piece of work that we've been using design methods to support uh, in collaboration with other um, disciplines, uh, other, other researchers. So those are two specific funded research projects. We've also um, been working closely with CSM's project uh, called Make at Story Garden, uh, an extensive collaboration with um, the local authority, Camden Council and Summerstown Community Association and um, the developer or landowner. Um, to, and our, our role here is to try and understand that the value that's being created through this initiative um, using um, humanities-based um, um, approaches to understanding value co-creation. Next slide, please. Um, and we're also just finishing another piece of work with the Northern Ireland Social Care Council, which is the regulatory body for 45,000 people in Northern Ireland 
who are social care workers uh, or social workers. Um, and that organization was tasked uh, by its ministry um, to um, co-design a future framework for, for skills development for social care. So here we've provided support um, involving some people from across UAL colleges and informed by research about how to um, help them design their framework um, in, a, in a participatory way. Moving on, um, we've also um, have done some work over the last year or so to connect uh, with course leaders to set a student brief. And a couple of them are mentioned here. The images here come from um, a project with uh, David Preston from uh, CSM Graphics. Um, and we've done one lot on child obesity and food systems, um, another lot on uh, connected autonomous vehicles, which are very much again tied to a research project that we are trying to do. So we're not setting a brief sort of plucked from the air. The brief um, agreed with the course leader and which the students respond to um, uh, is an opportunity to, to do a kind of research translation and has led, led to some extremely um, vivid and inspiring outputs. Next one, um, we also uh, have um, some research studentships funded by UAL with King's College London. Um, and Jeremy mentioned at the beginning that we counted about six um, PhD students who across UAL are, are touching on social design and design sustainability. And we hope to put in place um, more support, not just the old workshop for them in the future. But we also house four studentships with King's College London, um, which are specifically about the intersection of design um, and policy studies and political science. And one of them here, you see um, her name, Daniela Jenkins, um, who is uh, doing a rather wonderful project to redesign feminist pensions policy. Um, and I do encourage you to have a look at the website to find out a little bit more about that. Um, she, by the way, we have an event that Daniela will be chairing on Monday with two of another one of our PhD students um, and um, who works um, curating art um, interventions into UN meetings um, and also Stephen Bennett from Policy Lab, a team in the cabinet, uh, now the Department for Education, who's been a sort of visiting fellow with us for the last few months through an AHRC um, mini project. Um, next slide. Um, and then finally, we sometimes go to conferences. So there's one coming up, I think, yes, it's next week, Design is Coming Common Good, which is a chance to gather together. Um, and, and two of us, uh, Patricia and I, both have papers at this conference um, where we're trying to uh, do some of that critical uh, work, that problematization work, um, and we hope to be involved in further conferences. And finally, the last slide, um, is an example where um, we uh, in a small team are trying to articulate, um, a, 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 have a take on what social design is. Um, and we've got a draft uh, of some principles which uh, we put into another conference as well. So I think that's the last slide. Maybe one more, Lynn. Um, thank you. Yeah, so that's a, just a quick summary of the different kinds of activity, which is either research informed uh, in the case of teaching and learning briefs uh, or um, part of very large consortia and discipline, interdisciplinary projects where design is a kind of glue and enabler to move from insight to action, um, as well as trying to develop some critical and contextual perspectives. And I look forward to talking more. Thank you, Lucy. That's great. And thank you so much for keeping to time. Um, and so with no further ado, I'll hand over to Susan. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to Lucy and Kimball and uh, Mick Rearson for the company. Um, thanks for the early introduction. Um, I'm going to introduce myself again twice. So I'm Susan Poisson Locke, Susan P-E-I-S-A-N, two words, no hyphen, Locke. Susan Locke Poisson, or Luo Pei Shan, or Susan Locke Poisson, or Susan Luo Pei Shan, or Susan Locke, or Locke, or Locke, or Susie, Sue, or 
Sue without an E, or Susan Puisan Lock, Susan P U I S A N, two words, no hyphen, Lock, or Susan Lock Pui hyphen San, or Susan Puisan, one word, no hyphen, Lock, or no caps, Susan Puisan Lock. I'm Susan Poisson Locke, and I'm an artist, writer, and director of the Decolonizing Arts Institute. I won't have time to go into my own practice research as an artist writer, but I just wanted to hint there at the multiplicities and positionalities that I inhabit and play with. Some of you may have a sense of who, where, or what we are as an institute from our pages at arts.ac.uk, or from our mailing list and newsletters. I want to emphasize that we are very much emerging. So what I'm going to do on the assumption that uh, some of you may know nothing at all is to offer a little bit of background and context to the Institute's positioning and strategies and to touch on our initial programs and activities as well as on the research themes and interests of our fellows and associates. Um, I'll end by briefly mentioning a collaboration in the works with CCI. And just to also flag that if you're interested in finding a way to work with us or any of the institutes, we're currently inviting applications uh, to a new cross institutes associate scheme. And this call is live uh, until May. I'll pop that link um, in the chat shortly. Some background then. The Decolonizing Arts Institute began development in late 2018, following the end of the AHRC Black Artists and Modernism Project, uh, or BAM, which was led by artist and professor of black art and design at UAL, Sonia Boyce, with Dr. David DeBosa and myself as co-investigators. Acknowledging prior and parallel work across UAL led by colleagues in train, for example, the Research Center for Transnational Art, Identity and Nation, um, also after all exhibition histories work, Parks Decolonizing the Lens and Chris Apps Listening Projects. The Institute's research agenda takes up and expands on BAM's central question as a key point of departure. How do artists of African and Asian descent in Britain feature in the story of 20th century art? This question not only infers art historical oversights and amnesias and tendencies to frame black British art primarily or exclusively in terms of ethnicity and identity politics. And I'm invoking here a particular context and understanding of black that encompasses political and cultural solidarity. It's a question that raises further questions of disciplinary and discursive norms, terms and values or put more bluntly, a question of systemic discrimination and structural racism. How do artists of African and Asian descent in Britain feature in the story of 20th century art is a question that might also be understood as, how do we come to know or forget certain artists and artworks? How do some become highlights while others language in, in storage? The BAM project sought to both locate and quantify works by artists of African and Asian heritage in UK public collections, but also to differently qualify and understand them through close readings and approaches that recognize artists' agency and their works and practices as complex sites of artistic and cultural production and historic social and political intervention. The question of how we come to know or how we come to forget also cuts through the Institute's overarching questions. What does it mean to decolonize the arts? How do we decolonize the university from within? And how can we dismantle and transform what we know and what we do? Now, it's also important to ask who is doing this work and to say something about precarity. So I want to acknowledge all the artists, academics and staff of color who have worked and left or worked and survived, if not thrived in environments and structures that may support yet also undermine, elevate, yet also empower or disempower, celebrate yet also dehumanize. 
I also want to acknowledge here the important long-standing work of Shades of Noir, uh, now the Centre for Race and Practice-Based Social Justice, initiatives led by UAL Teaching and Learning Exchange and Arts SU, and student-led campaigns to liberate the curriculum and call out institutional racism. Yesterday, the Institute hosted a visiting speaker, Professor Gaminda Bambra, who talked about the imbrication of epistemological justice and material reparations. The need to reckon with histories of thought and critical thinking, bound up with colonial histories and their enduring legacies of, for example, displacement and uh, environmental crises. She spoke about the need to address the colonial structures of thought that dominate how we then come to understand and to understand ourselves and others to redefine concepts of freedom and progress, for example, and to reshape possibility. something about precarity. After a year of development, the Institute is now in a pilot phase extended by the pandemic. So we are very much at the beginning of our journey. We are a small core team with two permanent staff and several fractional short-term appointments. I feel it's important to acknowledge that the precarity of individuals and institute or institute and individuals are intertwined and our challenges have been heightened in a year that has seen everyone differently and unequally experienced and impacted by COVID-19 compounded by the resurgence of Black Lives Matter and the rise in misogynistic and anti-Asian violence. As director, I want to see the Institute as porous, evolving, decentered, constituted through dialogue and collaboration. My approach is to create connections, nurture relations, open or invent doors, and point to possible paths that others may lead into spaces they convene and curate to enable other ways of seeing, hearing, making, and knowing. So we've been hosting conversations within and without, for example, a recent British Art Network seminar series, and more recently round tables taking place through March under the theme of cultural urgencies, actions towards representation, equity, justice, and well-being. These are being convened by the Institute's research fellows and associates, with the exception of the opening event, Decentering Fashion, which was guest hosted by Professor Shahid Abari, with colleagues from the Cultural and Historical Studies Department at LCF, and guests from the VNA. This was followed by a discussion on decolonizing the university and the role of linguistic diversity, hosted by Dr. Victoria Odenyi. And then a discussion on cultural narratives of interlocking crises, COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, hosted by Dr. Karani Baroka. Next week, Dr. Ileana Selahan will focus on Roma Lives, reflections on art and visual culture. And the series will close with a roundtable on curating Black British Art Now, hosted by Dr. Anjali Dalal Clayton. I want to quickly mention our three parallel research residency programs, which are Decolonizing Archives, a partnership with UAL Archives and Special Collections to provoke reflexive institutional interrogation. Decolonizing Collections, a curatorial research network in partnership with Arts Council Collection, British Council Collection, and Manchester Art Gallery Collections, supported by Art Fund. And Digital Archives, an artist in remote residency partnership with Innova. Decolonizing Archives is now in its second year and welcomed proposals that focus on a specific collection or aspect of a collection and or a specific artwork with approaches that may challenge, for example, dominant narratives of identity, nation, culture, language, heritage, Britishness, Eurocentrism, 
westernization, modernism, feminism, radicalism, activism, whiteness, blackness, race, class, gender, sexuality, disability, age, belief, and the politics of institutional memory and silence. Our first group of researchers were Elisa Adami, Karani Baroka, Ana Gonzalez Rueda, and Mohamed Namazi. Our second group of researchers are Alice Correa, Michelle Gamaka Williams, Hannah Jones, and Nina Trevedi. We recently welcomed Marenka Thompson Odlin, Vera May, and Harvey Diamond on the Decolonizing Collections Curatorial Research Network. And we'll be announcing the Digital Archives Artist in Remote Residence with Innova soon. These are modest scale programs that through cross connection and mutual sharing will, we hope, lead to reciprocal critical support networks for individual, individuals and institutions alike. With impacts beyond in terms of resources for staff, students and other researchers and practitioners. All three programs relate to larger scale projects on the horizon, including a major bid currently underway for a three year project in partnership with CCI called Transforming Collections, Reimagining Art, Nation and Heritage. And this aims to challenge the knowledge is held and produced, known and unknown within and across collections and the possibilities for a distributed yet connected evolving national collection that confronts and embraces our contested histories. This is probably a good moment for me to stop and for Mick to take over. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Thanks so much, Susan. That was incredibly clear for a concise summary of what I think is really important and I think would be recognized as, as important work. So Mick, over to you for your 10 minutes, and then if people could be preparing questions in their heads, then we can move on to that. Okay, everyone, I'm hoping you can hear me all right. Let me just um, fire up the presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, I wanna start by saying thanks to Susan and to Lucy, and also to Jeremy. Uh, it's great to have, to be here talking to you alongside um, such excellent colleagues who are doing such amazing work um, that we all find inspiring. Um, I'm going to be as quick as I can. So yeah, the Creative Computing Institute, we've been going since, um, well, for two or three years now, and we've got uh, undergraduate programs and postgraduate programs up and running. But I just want to talk about our research. Um, we've got three research themes, creativity, machine learning and AI, human computer interaction, and platforms, big data, and digital citizenship. And I wanna talk about those three briefly. So creativity, machine learning, and AI pursues um, new knowledge in how machine learning and artificial intelligence can accelerate and transform the creative industries in the 21st century. We have some grants in that area at the moment, including the MIMIC grant, which I'm gonna talk about, the Welcome Hub grant, which I'm also gonna talk about, and an Institute of Coding grant. Um, we also have a bunch of students whose work has been important in this field, and it's good to talk about their work too, and I'm going to do that towards the end. HCI, human-computer interaction, is also a really important thing for us, I think also because it's a method which is associated, uh, well, HCI contains methods that are really strongly associated with a lot of the research that we do and that our students do. We're in a kind of unique position, really, to impact on HCI research for a number of reasons. One of them is that our reader, Dr. Rebecca Fiebrink, is an ACM SIGCHI paper chair. Um, and Kai has an impact factor of 15. So it's, it's a great place for us to publish. And we've got, we've got a good track record of publishing there. Uh, so the methodologies of HCI are core to what we do. Platforms, big data, and digital citizenship ask questions about contemporary digital systems, online services, and social platforms. These are ub ubiquitous problems as well as solutions. They're exploring and understanding human behavior and they're becoming central to our economy and they have a significant impact on, you know, uh, our, how we see ourselves. They have ethical and social implications that we want to address. Lots of our work 
uh, is exploring the theme of accessibility in relation to this and democratization. Um, we can do a lot more than that. We have some active great, uh, grants in this area and we're hiring new people, in, including Dr. Peaks Craft, who I think will be leading in the future in these fields. So let's talk about live research projects. The MIMIC project is a live project funded by UKRI. It's one million pounds, collaboration with Durham, Sussex, uh, Google Magenta and Goldsmiths. It's a platform that allows you to make music and art with machine intelligence. And um, it's actually also a programming platform. So we use it for teaching people how to write software as well as building interfaces to make it easier for people to use AI and machine learning to make artworks and interactive systems. A lot of this work is based on stuff we've done before in the last 10 years, including really seminal work by Rebecca, Rebecca Thiebrink, who I already mentioned, um, including her Wekinator platform, which was launched in 2009. It's been downloaded, I think, nearly 50,000 times. It's used by a great many artists, even at UAL, I keep tripping across artists who are using Rebecca's systems. And a lot of the work that we do plays into this and uses similar techniques and approaches. Also, some of our PhD students, including Memo Acton, are widely regarded as being important in this field uh, over the last six years. Uh, and Terence Broad is uh, another of our PhD students who produced the very first video uh, with a deep learning system that was bought by a major museum. Another project we have is the Welcome Hub, which is a collaboration, another one million pound grant, two year project in collaboration with Heart and Soul, who are a learning disabled charity that supports the perspectives of disabled artists, um, predominantly learning disabled and autistic artists. So really we wanna challenge the idea of what is normal, you know, um, to break, to think about social groupings and to try to break them up, to consider how social networks reinforce notions of in and out groups. This has led to a number of projects and there's a, a bunch of websites that explore what learning disabled people think of society. And it also um, led to the creation of a platform specifically for um, supporting data science led by researchers who have learning disabilities. So our platform allows for people with learning disabilities to conduct data science on, on the UK. And that's what they did. And that's a lot of what the project has been about. We're also active in AI and virtual reality. We've got a collaboration called the 4i project, um, which incorporates, um, yeah, teams at Gibson Martelli, also at Goldsmiths. That's led to an epic mega grant this is a small amount of funds. I mean, the uh, 4i project is roughly half a million. The Epic Mega Grant is only 25 grand, but it's to take the technology that we built in 4i, predominantly built by Rebecca and Phoenix, and to get it into the Unreal Engine, which um, I don't know if any of you know, is used by lots of games companies. So this is about allowing people, helping people, supporting them to use AI machine learning in VR and M uh, sorry, in VR and augmented reality projects. We also are active with Microsoft Research, including this project, Tokyo, which um, has been going for the last five years, focused on the Tokyo Olympics. It's about using AI and machine learning and HCI approaches to support people with visual impairments, uh, including using robotics and other approaches. More recently, Dr. Vali Laliotti, who is a uh, researcher at CCI, has begun a collaboration with Imperial and the Royal College of Music to deal with the health, economic and social impact of COVID-19 on professionals in the arts using VR. All this work has led to a range of different types of research outputs, but we also focus on educational outputs both inside CCI and beyond. Our Future Learn program features a number of courses, two of which I'm going to highlight. Um, one of them is called Create Accessible Interfaces, which was created in collaboration with disabled people, including people with learning disabilities and visual impairments. Another was Introduction to Creative AI. And in total, these courses and the others that we've put on the FutureLearn platform have had 60,000 learners since May last year. They're now part of the government skills toolkit, uh, which are 
really the free parts of those um, courses. At the moment, they're all free and they'll remain so for a substantial part of this year. Um, but the free ones that stay free will all continue to be part of the skills toolkit, um, which incorporates those two that I've just shown you. Uh, and that's a really big deal. We're really proud that we've been able to have some impact on the government. Uh, and all that stuff is also supported by Mimic, the platform that I mentioned at the start, which we use as a mechanism for delivering a lot of learning. In addition, that platform has been use, used by professionals, including by Massive Attack, who used it to, um, in collaboration, well, I collaborated with Massive Attack to produce an installation as part of the Barbican's five-year touring exhibition, AI More Than Human, which has been widely written about. And this ended up in the UKRI AI Opportunity Statement just a couple of months ago, where they described the project and also the research which led to it. Following that, I worked with Nesta to draft an open letter to the Chancellor to support a new National Centre for AI and the Creative Industries, which was, wide, was widely supported, predominantly because of the way creative industries intersects with a more diverse range of people who have a lot to say about what AI should be doing. Part of this was supported by research I did for the IOC, where we found a wide number of people in creative economy, uh, in the creative economy, were already using AI and data science. This includes our own students who are working in collaboration with Google on funded studentships to see how designers are using AI. And also how people who are writing new fiction are using AI to help them understand the kinds of stories that their audiences might like, including professional publishers like Unbound. Further to that, Dr. Anna Troisi, who is head of our BSc program, has a project funded by UKRI called Coast, which is based in Bamburi Beach, Kenya, creating an aural archive of children's experiences in the local region to be disseminated online. In addition, recently we've been collaborating with local organizations, including at Battersea Power Station, specifically the Power to Connect program, which donates waste electrical equipment to needy children in the South London area. And I'm lobbying in conversation with our IT services provision to see if we can find a way to contribute to these kinds of programs. Finally, there's one story I want to share about a student of mine who produced a website in December called Crypto Art WTF, which demonstrated, oh, that's my timer, <laughs> demonstrated that um, crypto art, although it's making millions of pounds, millions of dollars, I should say, for some artists, is sucking up huge amounts of energy and potentially causing uh, a dangerous impact on the planet. Um, and this website, he's just recently taken it down because it generated so much interest. It led to a, an awful lot of work, an awful lot of uh, journalism, I guess, which began to impact on artists who weren't really using blockchain negatively. So people, it was attracting a lot of negative attention because the statement had, uh, had been so widespread in terms of other people writing about it. So um, I think that we're really engaged in trying to understand what more we can do. I don't think we feel we're doing enough. And our strategy for the next five years incorporates trying to find mechanisms where we can better contribute to these agendas. And that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mick. And thanks to Susan and Lucy for being so brilliantly professional and keeping on time. And just, I mean, I, I, I knew some of the work but I didn't know all of the work of all the institutes. And I think that we can be collectively incredibly proud of the work that, that you're all doing. Um, I don't see yet any questions. So maybe, maybe you can help me. Um, as, as PVC research and James. So given the increasing mood of particularly this government towards the privileging of, of STEM in relation to industrial strategy, in relation to research agendas and so on and so forth. How would you make the argument simply, if I was sat in front of a politician, to say why 
UAL and its research and its methods can and should make a contribution to these issues of earth equity and, and racial justice or, or to the big global challenges. What, what argument would you make about the role of creative arts research in relation to societal transformation? Lucy, do you want to uh, make, make you on my screen? So do you, do you want to start? <laughs> I think it's a tough question. From our point of view, the incentives for industry and for society are fundamental. And incentives are often about good stories and also about good communications. But they're also about representing diverse views from people who are often ignored by a consensus of people in politics and industry. So because of our networks, because of the people that we reach and the ideas that those people represent, we have a capacity to tell stories, which I think can transform agendas. That's one way we can do this. Another way is, you mentioned STEM. One of my life's ambitions is to try to rub out the line between STEM and the arts. I feel it's an unnecessary distinction. I feel it's founded on some, uh, on, on I think, perver again, perverse incentives, which are designed to marginalize, in many cases, imaginative, creative voices. So I would start with those things, but I'm, I've got to say it's a tough question and I'm thinking on my feet. We all are. Susan, do you want to, do you want to jump in? Not particularly, if I'm honest. Um, I don't have a snappy answer. I think it's uh, above all our pay grades to be able to answer this question. Um, I think what I wanted to pick up on an echo perhaps in what uh, Mick said was the importance of inhabiting that non-consensus, non-normative space and to articulate from that space um, in ways that because we engage in and with critical um, cultural um, modes, forms, spaces of production, um, and without wanting to romanticize in any way the, the figure of the artist, the figure of the creative, the cultural producer. Um, now, if we have a USB, it's, it's USP, it's, it's, it's seeing things differently. It's, ex, it's seeing, experiencing, thinking, listening, attending to the world and, and, and the smaller and larger things around us in a different, different from the normative um, way um, and making a big noise about it where we can. Yeah. And Lucy, I know that in some of your work that you've you've actually have made the breakthrough of, of persuading more traditionally minded research institutes to engage with, with you. So maybe you can give us some hints about, about how you've achieved that. Um, maybe I'll just step back for a moment. There's a growing consensus that given the uh, nature and the interconnections between the massive challenges uh, faced by communities and societies around the world, new thinking is needed. Um, regular surveys of chief executives, you know, what's your top list of the five things? Creativity appears in those lists. Um, Bayes, uh, the business department recently published something saying creativity is needed um, and, and, and all sorts of university disciplines are muscling in on what we could say in art and design as our our key expertise. So um, I think one of the ways I position it when I talk to researchers from other disciplines, who quite often say, oh, can you help us organize a workshop? Um, they, they recognize that they're good at insight generation and the production of knowledge. And one of the capacities of art and design is to enable exploration and translation. I'm not saying that art and design doesn't also produce novel insights um, and certainly it produces new ideas, um, but there's something about the need for um, spaces of exploration and deliberation and co-production in relation to these uh, massive structural problems um, faced by society. And so, you know, in a sense, that's the core expertise differentially practiced through different dis art and design disciplines and forms of institutional arrangement but that is the core expertise of art and design 
So art and design experts, practitioners, researchers, and indeed our, the amazing capacity of, of students as the uh, Public Collaboration Lab has shown over many years um, and many other projects across UAL. If, if that is, you know, why, why wouldn't you go to where the expertise is? Yeah, I agree with all of those answers. And they were, you were modest in saying that each of you that you couldn't do it because I think actually those the responses are important. So we've got some questions coming through. The first is from Adriana. So it looks like um, I posted it myself, but actually it came from Adriana. She happens to be my PhD student. But um, what Adriana is saying, I observe, it may be because the Institute is quite young, but I observe that the subject of the built environment and its connection with spatial practice does not feature much within the Institute in comparison to fashion, design, archival, for example. Is there any specific reason for that? I, does 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 your work, Lucy or or Susan, would that extend into an understanding and a and a critique of of of, of spatial practices in the built environment? I, I would say um, architecture is a particular form of design profession that's institutionalised in a different way to say product design or graphic design. Um, at scale, the Social Design Institute is with, as Susan said, staff on insecure contracts and, and, and part-time contracts. It's very hard to do more than we're already doing, but I think the ambition would be to grow. And if we take the current example of the uh, analysis we're doing for the design economy, that absolutely has the built environment um, as one of the important domains to uh, where well, actually I was say the built environment is leading and fashion um, compared to other areas of design and understanding social and environmental impact. So uh, it's not that um, it's excluded, it's maybe not apparent and, and a spatial awareness and set of practices I think should and can be built into future activities. And Susan, how far how far does, the, does your institute expand the definition of arts? Oh, is that, I thought that was a different question. <laughs> um, if I know, uh, okay. yeah. does, it, yeah. does, it, does it expand in spatial practices? I think, I think so insofar as, um, I mean, implicitly in, in terms of our engagement um, with museums and galleries as institutions and as buildings um, instituted by and through um, colonial histories and practices. So there's the potential to, to delve into these um, uh, institutions as buildings, um, potential to, to look into how they came to be funded and built, yep. um, the, the dedications of various parts of those buildings to various uh, esteemed or, or, or maybe not so um, individuals. Um, and then in terms of how they then um, organize, arrange, display the objects that they hold, there's a lot of spatial poetics, politics, um implicit or explicitly you know there to be interrogated so it's not an explicit um thematic i think again to do with um our capacity um we're very conscious of the multiple ways in which we could and need to really engage with our various institutional partners but um we're both limited and led by the the researchers that we bring on board to work with them Okay, that's great. Thank you. But also, clearly, I think that some of the critiques and ways of, of unraveling the, the structures of power can be transferred into, into spatial understandings too. So I think that that's fairly, would be fairly clear to me. So we now got another question um, from Lucy Panasar, which reads, one for Susan first and then one for Mick. Um, thanking you first of all, which I support um, and, and acknowledging the commitment to social justice. So does, Susan, does your institute um, extend to archives outside of the UAL and in particular the troublesome and archives related to British colonialism? Um, yes, again, uh, in principle and in terms of what we're actually beginning to do, the um, curatorial research network that I mentioned earlier, um, supported by Art Fund, is enabling us to uh, do funded research with um, the Arts Council Collection, British Council Collection, 
and uh, continue conversations with the government art collection, as well as work directly with the Manchester Art Gallery collections. Um, all of which um, in more or less obvious ways um, can be interrogated in, in terms of their um, colonial um, beginnings or intersections with the British Council in particular, um, many aspects of um, uh, objects collections held by Manchester. So it's beginning to happen in, in that way. Um, and what we hope to be able to do um, through a project I hinted at with, with CCI um, and you know, into the future is to, to do this, conduct this kind of work at a larger scale. Um, right now we're trying to work strategically with um, organizations that we already have some kind of relationship with through the, um, the BAM project, um, which engaged with over 30 different organizations, collections of different scales. Um, with these short-term funded um, projects, we're engaging with perhaps, um, I think, uh, I want to say, I wanted to say three, and then I wanted to say 25, somewhere between the two, different partners and researchers engaging with different aspects of collections. And then, um, and then it's around 15, um, this uh, project upcoming with Mick, but I'll, I'll let uh, Mick respond to the second question. Thanks, Susan. Um, I think that's a, a good dovetail. Um, so I'm really deeply engaged in work with archives and have been for a long time. Um, I founded the Daphne Oram Collection, which is an archive of, ex of experimental music and papers and materials um, from the electronic composer, music composer Daphne Oram. And uh, we used uh, machine learning and AI to try to uncover that hidden collection. Uh, and um, obviously there are, there's so much more we could do with those techniques. And one thing that we want to do is try to extend a whole range of work that we've looked at in archives um, with Susan uh, as part of extending the amazing work that's happened as a result of the BAM project and also, you know, in relation to the, the overall goals of the Decolonising Art Institute. So I think that, yeah, you know, that's a really important thing for us. And um, there's a lot we could do. I think, you know, in fairness, there's, um, there's it's a, a feature of computing that it often gets used as a, as a means to kind of, to tell everybody, oh, this is a solution for your problem. And I think that um, we're sort of, we're not really in that mold. We're more like, how can we support what humans want to do with computing? How can we create tools and technologies that aren't there to just, to kind of like, yeah, to erase people's desires for what they want, but it, instead to support their desires. And I think that's overall, that's why we want to collaborate as much as possible. Okay, that's great. So, which brings us on to Felicity's question, which I think is, 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 is also, a statement as well as a question, which is, is there an opportunity for the institutes to share and compare messages for our practices across UAL? And I, I understand you do all get together. So I, I, Lucy's got her thumb up. So can you just say yes or no? Everyone's got it up. There is an opportunity. We probably need to formalise it rather more. And to and Lucy, uh, and Felicity as as an associate dean of research can can help in that. So I think you have lots of thumbs up, Felicity, rather than um words and let's just end because susan needs to leave in five minutes with i think hunter's important question which i'm i'm particularly um sympathetic to because i've just stopped using the word sustainability in my own work in fact i've i've got a i've got a lecture called um an invitation called corrections where each of us being asked to correct something we've done wrong in our lives and mine is i use the word sustainability for too long um, and so Hunter's question is, is, is there a danger that words such as decolonizing and intersectionality get to the same fate as sustainability? They become so mainstream that actually they, they lose their, their agency, their poignancy and their importance. So Susan, maybe you can, you can lead on that one. Short answer, yes, there's always that danger with any word, with any terminology, with any language use. And the important thing is to continually resituate, recontextualize and be specific and particular about how, um, how you're using words. Um, so, you know, a, 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 I would say, take it back, Jeremy, don't let go of it. I think it's, you know, if, if we're not going to ever arrive at terms that, um, 
are universally agreed upon in terms of um, truths and, and, and definitions. Um, and one of the things that, you know, it's been really interesting about the conversations with um, Mick over machine learning and AI and how we might bring this work together is really understanding that these are not truth finding missions or truth finding mechanisms. We have to keep contextualizing and contesting um, our, our own and collective usages. I'd agree. And I think there is a difference between sustainability, which has been appropriated by the corporate world um, in, a, in a manner which is often unacceptable, um, versus the more pointy words of, of intersectionality and decolonizing, which I think it's quite difficult for the corporate world to appropriate in the same way. Um, but I think, I think your answer is good, so thank you for that. Um, we are two minutes over. I don't see any more questions, but I think it's been a great session and I hope that everybody will feel empowered and interested to go to the various institutes. There is, um, as I forget who said, I think Susan said, a scheme to be associates of, of the institutes and that we will, we can put up as well. And many thanks to Susan, to Mick and to Lucy for coming along on a Friday afternoon and presenting their institutes and their work and their actually amazing work. So thanks all and thank you to everyone for attending and have a great weekend. The sun is out and there's only one week left of term. <laughs> <laughs>